So um, it is my privilege this morning to introduce to us our next uh, guest lecturer for today's uh, program. He's in the person of Professor Pierre Laporte. Pierre is an economist by training. He is the country manager or country director for Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone for the World Bank. Before that, Pierre was the governor of the Central Bank of Seychelles, as well as the Minister for Finance, Investment, and Trade. Uh, he was also the former country representative for the IMF in Niger. There are a couple of Nigerians here, pro, um, Prof, this morning. Um, for our lecture this morning, he will be taking us on the topic economics and multilateral institutions. And when we say multilateral institutions, we are talking about the World Bank, the IMF, the IFC, those kinds of institutions. Um, rising through the ranks in these institutions for Africans. And fortunately for us, almost everyone here is an African. So he will be dwelling on this topic and centering on career development generally and social capital. So with a round of applause, let us welcome our guest speaker, Professor Pierre Laporte. So thank you very much, uh, uh, MC, and uh, good morning to all of you. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor for me to, to be here today to speak to you about this uh, important uh, subject. Uh, colleague has already introduced me, so I will not uh, repeat that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself later when I talk about uh, examples of uh, you know, Africans who's risen through to hold important positions in the institutions. So today I will talk to you about uh, the World Bank. The World Bank as a group, the World Bank as an institution. And give you some examples, like I've said, of, uh, you know, Africans, Ghanaians, others who've risen through the ranks as the title say here. So who we are? Who are we? With 189 member countries and staff from more than 170 countries, the World Bank Group is a unique global partnership comprising five institutions working for sustainable solutions aimed at reducing poverty and building a more shared prosperity in developing countries. All five institutions work to achieve the World Bank Group's twin goals of ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD, and the International Development Association, IDA, as we call it, combined are commonly known as the World Bank. There are five institutions within the group. I will talk about this later in detail, as these are the institutions that I am representing as country director, based in Ghana, responsible for Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Perhaps lesser known of the group are IFC, MIGA, and ICSID. Beginning with IFC, short for International Finance Corporation, is the largest global development institution focused on the private sector, private sector development in developing countries. IFC advances economic development and improves the lives of people by encouraging the growth of the private sector in these countries. This is achieved by creating new markets, mobilizing other investors, and sharing expertise. In doing so, IFC creates jobs and raise living standards, especially for the poor and the vulnerable. MIGA. MIGA stands for Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, which aims to promote cross-border investments in developing countries by providing guarantees, both political risk insurance and credit enhancement to investors and lenders. MIGA's guarantees protect, protect investments against non-commercial risks and can help 
investors obtain better access to funding sources with improved financial terms and conditions. Just speaking a little bit more about this. Basically, MIGA, if a foreign investor comes to Ghana, say, I want to invest in whatever uh, plant or et cetera, and I want to buy MIGA insurance. It's slightly different from financial insurance is, is that MIGA provides political risk insurance. If tomorrow government of Ghana decides to change the law, then which affects a foreign investor directly as a result of changes in policies or, or laws, then they can turn to MIGA and get some, some support. ICSID, the International Center for Settlement and Investment Disputes, is the world's leading institution devoted to international investment dispute settlement. It has extensive experience in this field, having administered the majority of all international investment cases. ICSID provides for settlement of disputes by concili conciliation, arbitration, or fact-finding. And ICSID process is designed to take account of special characteristics of international investment disputes and parties involved, maintaining a careful balance between the interests of investors and host states. Now, maybe more interesting for me, and maybe for you, because this is where the large interventions are from the World Bank, is the IBRD and IDA. IBRD is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is a global development cooperative owned by 189 member countries. What do we mean? Many times I tell people, the World Bank belongs to the world. Doesn't belong to people who sit in Washington and give money or take decisions because every country in the world essentially is a member of the World Bank, which means we have countries who lend money as donor countries and those who borrow money, such as Ghana. But each, each, of, each country has a subscription that is paid as a member, and each of us have our say through the, the board of executive directors that represent the country. So it's not because Ghana or Sierra Leone or Liberia or any other country receives money from the World Bank that they are just here to accept everything. They have a say in how these decisions are run, decisions are made through representation at the board. So as the largest development bank in the world, it supports the World Bank Group's mission by providing loans, guarantees, risk management products, and advisory services to middle-income and credit-worthy low-income countries, as well as by coordinating responses to regional and global challenges. Originally created in 1944 as one half of the Bretton Woods Institution to help Europe rebuild after the war, IBRD was later joined by IDA. And IDA, the International Development Association, is the part of the World Bank that helps the poorest countries. So in Ghana, the resources that we lend are from the IDA window. And then we have the IBRD window, which we talked about. The difference being IDA helps the poorer countries, middle-income, low-income countries, whereas IBRD lends for countries that are a bit more advanced in development, let's say South Africa, the Mauritius, Seychelles, whatever countries which are, which are more advanced. And because these countries are more advanced, the IBRD window is less concessional. It means the repayment terms are less favorable. For instance, Ghana borrows on average from the World Bank for 30 to 40, 35 to 40 year loans, whereas countries in IBRD, they borrow repaying 25 years at a high interest rate. Why we do that? Because as poorer countries, your ability to repay your loan is, you know, is less, so we have to give you better terms. So the, the International Development Association is, like I said, is part of the World Bank that helps the poorest countries. It was established in 1960 and aims to reduce poverty, like I said, by providing zero to, to low interest loans and grants for programs that boost economic growth, reduce inequalities, 
and improve living conditions. So we don't only give lo we don't only give long term loans for some countries, especially the poorest ones. We actually give grants, donation, um, because again the difficulty to repay a loan compared to others. So Ida complements IBRE from the World Bank because it supports a range of development activities that pave the way toward more equality, more equity, economic growth, job creation, higher incomes, and better living conditions. IDA is one of the largest sources of assistance for the World Bank's 74 poorest countries and is the single largest source of donor funds or basic social services in these countries. What do we do in Ghana? Since joining the World Bank Group in 1957, Ghana has benefited from approximately 10 billion US dollars in funding in support of a wide range of programs, projects, and investments. For instance, the Akosombo Dam, also known as the Volta Dam, was constructed under the Volta River Hydroelectric Project, which was the first loan that the World Bank extended to Ghana. The World Bank program in Ghana today is worth approximately $3.6 billion in credits and grants across 30 projects and programs. Of total financing, about 90% is from IDA and the remaining is from the sector-specific trust funds. The portfolio has, balanced, has a balanced spread across all sectors with the largest investments in finance and competitiveness, 14%. Education, 13%. Social protection and jobs, 11%. And health, 10%. Financing in the remaining sectors range from 3 to 8%. We also have cross-cutting themes, which are market developments, job creation, skills development. What do I mean by cross-cutting themes? What we say is there are certain issues that are important to us and that cut across the development sphere. For instance, uh, job creation. We can have a project in health, in education, in financial sector. The aspect of job creation is there. We have other cross-cutting things like today becoming much more important, digitalization. What we're saying is cross-cutting because whatever we do, whatever project we do, digitalization is there today. We live with it, we, can, we cannot avoid it. If you do, as you know, during the COVID, more kids did learning at home through their computers. Um, we, at the World Bank, we still close, the office is largely closed. We've been working from home through Zoom calls, etc. cetera. Uh, anything that you do in agriculture today, the farmers are using digitalization, using their phones to get prices, to get weather, information, so cut across. That's what we call it, cross-cutting themes. And going forward, we're just about now to finalize the new country partnership framework, country strategy for Ghana, which will focus on three areas going forward. The first is enhancing conditions for private sector development and quality job creation. The second, improving inclusive service delivery, and the third is promoting resilient and sustainable development. The World Bank is committed to fostering diversity and inclusion in both our work and our workplace. This is extremely important for us. We are committed to a workplace where everyone is valued, where differences are respected and celebrated, and where opportunity and equitable treatment is afforded to all. Ensuring that diversity is integrated into our daily work means creating a culture and practices that recognize value and harness what makes every individual unique in the broader sense. By acknowledging and respecting differences, including nationality, gender, and gender identity, race, religion, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, disability, and educational background. So why do we put so much emphasis on diversity and inclusion? Beyond the moral imperative, it makes good business sense on three key fronts. 
First, a diverse staff mirrors the diversity of the clients that we serve and the partners we work alongside in more than 180 countries around the world. And that key reflection, that reflection is key to our credibility as an institution seeking equity and opportunity for all. Second, it has been demonstrated that a diverse staff stimul stimulates the creativity and innovation our clients expect. Drawn from the collective energy of individual experience, knowledge, and perspectives. Thirdly, why we put so much emphasis on diversity and inclusion is because as the world's leading development organization, a diverse staff also allows us to attract, retain, and grow the finest talent from the broader span of different possible backgrounds. In short, if we succeed in leveraging the diversity of our talent, then the solutions that we offer through our projects, programs, and assistance are those that will meet our clients' development goals. An inclusive, an inclusive work environment is one where staff are enabled to meet their full potential and do not experience stigma and intolerance. Do we have the level of representation? No. There is more work to be done. Just to give you a few statistics, approximately 3,100 of our staff are from the United States and Canada. 2,100 are from Latin America and the Caribbean. Only 830 are from the Middle East and North Africa. Over 3,000 staff are from Europe and Central Asia, and 2,200 from the Pacific. Finally, only 2,200, sorry, from Africa. Considering the population of youth and the large pool of talents in Africa, and also the volume of operations being implemented on the continent, it is safe to say that Africa is underrepresented in the World Bank. This holds true for most of the other multilateral institutions as well. And this is why the World Bank is constantly on the lookout for talent to embark on a journey together to ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Let me talk a little bit about our recruitment. The World Bank Group's recruitment policy is to hire staff of the highest caliber on as wide a geographical basis as possible with preference to nationals of World Bank Group member countries or countries of operations. We are proud to be an equal, we are proud to be an equal opportunity and inclusive employer not discriminating, as I said earlier, based on gender, gender identity, religion, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or disability. We offer competitive salaries and benefits, and there are a number of ways in which interested students can apply. I'll run through this very quickly. First is the Young Professional Program, which is a two-year leadership development program at the start of a five-year employment contract with the World Bank. IFC Omega. The young professionals start the program in Washington, D.C., where they engage in intensive training on the job and in the classroom, learning the fundamentals of leadership and development operations across institutions and how to identify opportunities for joint impact. The other program we have is the Bank Internship Program, the BIP, which also offers highly motivated individuals an opportunity to be exposed to the mission and the work of the World Bank. The internship allows individuals to bring new perspectives, innovative ideas, and research experience into the bank's work while improving skills in a diverse environment. And for those with more experience, I think I fall into that category, I joined the bank six years ago, Vacancies are available on the website, at headquarters and field offices for various job families and contract types. The World Bank routinely conducts recruitment drive for Africa, targeted at military professionals and technical specialists 
with at least five years experience in a sector. I'll talk a little bit about carry development in the bank. One of our most important challenges as an organization is to find and retain the most qualified, experienced, and skills, skilled staff to effectively fulfill the mandate and achieve our goals in a rapidly changing world. There are no pre-planned and hardwired carry paths laid down in front. It is important for everyone to take charge of their own careers, to know how to navigate the options, and to be proactive in pursuing the goals. Taking charge of your career and maintaining it competently and independently means an ongoing commitment to planning and actively engaging in, in your own professional and personal development. Let me share an analogy used by some of my HR colleagues. They say career development is like rock climbing. The traditional career ladder were a clear, straight path with regular upward movements was pretty fine and blind, does not exist in most organizations. We compare carry management to rock climbing because it illustrates the way carries typically move these days, generally towards a goal, but varying in direction based on opportunities that come along. The analogy shows that the way up is sometimes shut and the best path is still unclear when you embark on your journey as you cannot make out many details for the higher part of the wall. In order to keep on moving, it sometimes requires and even a step down before the next possible movement becomes clear and available. So needless to say, there is also the parallel between rock climbing and carry management in that both typically require some serious effort and dedication. In both, every progress you make on your journey makes you feel more confident about your ability to also handle the next challenges well. Like uh, we said before, there's been uh, quite a number of successful African leaders whom uh, ex you know, we, can, we can look up to as inspiration. Uh, I understand that the mission of the Academic City University College is to nurture future young African leaders. So I'd like to share some names that have held or are in the senior positions at multilateral institutions, including the World Bank and other institutions. Arguably, the most famous person is from Ghana, if not from Africa, to have held a leadership role at the highest level, the late Kofi Atta Annan. A Nobel Peace Prize laureate, he served as the seventh Secretary General of the United Nations from January 1997 to December 2006. He began his professional career as a budget officer for the World Health Organization in Geneva. This is, this is a very interesting point because very often we see people in very high positions, but actually we all start at the bottom. Maybe I'll give you a little bit my own example later. Another person, my fellow country representative from WHO in Ghana, is Dr. Francis Chisaka Kasolo, an infectious, infectious disease physician and specialization in clinical virology. He began his career with WHO more than 18 years ago and rose through the ranks. Of course, there are many of us from Africa taking leadership roles at the World Bank. I'm also from Africa, as he said, coming from the tiny islands of Seychelles. Another important person, Ms. Victoria Kwakwa, is the Vice President, Strategic Corporate Initiatives at the World Bank. She's Ghanaian, and she joined the bank as a young professional in 1989 and has since held various positions. She has extensive field experience in Nigeria, Rwanda, and Vietnam more recently. Another one, not from Ghana, but from nearby, Mr. Usman Diagana. Usman Diagana is my vice president. Vice president is responsible for Western and Central African countries in the World Bank. 
He leads relations with 20, 22 different countries and oversees a portfolio of projects, technical assistance, and financial resources worth more than 40 billion US dollars. A Mauritanian national, he began his career like others as an operations officer in Benin back in 1992, rose through the ranks. He was a country director like me. Today he's the vice president of the World Bank. Another important one, Mr. Makta Diop, who is now the managing director and ex executive vice president of IFC, International Finance Corporation, which I spoke about earlier. Mr. Diop, an economist by training, started his career in the banking industry before joining the IMF and later the World Bank. He has also held several government positions, most notably as Minister of Economy and, Fi and Finance of Senegal. I'm not as important as them, but I'll give you a little bit of my career. I started from, from Polytechnic back in Seychelles as a clerk in the, in the central bank. You start from the, when you join the bank, your first job is a clerk. You start at the cashier, you take money, then you go around, you learn a little bit from all the departments. Then I got the opportunity for scholarship, did my first degree, came back, went back, did my postgrad. And then in 2002, when I had uh, been uh, up to Director General of Research and Statistics in the bank, I got the opportunity to join the IMF, International Monetary Fund. I spent seven years as an economist in the IMF, four years at headquarters, like you said earlier, three years as a representative of the IMF in Niger. I held a Nigerian seat, right? Can you wave your hands? Raise your hands. Anybody from Niger? No? Okay. Okay, I lived in Niger for three years. Then uh, in 2008, I, I, I got a call to come and take the role of governor of Central Bank of Seychelles, which with some hesitancy I, I accepted because on the one hand, you were leaving your good job at the IMF to go back home. At the same time, it was a difficult time. The country was in crisis and it's a risk. You're going to take a job. What if it doesn't work out? And then after three and a half years, I was asked to become finance minister of my country. Again, I hesitated because I'm, I'm not a politician and I wasn't. I made a deal with the president that I would become finance minister, but not to be part of the political party. We accepted, it worked out. I did three years. And then in 2015, there was gonna be elections. I thought it was a good time for me to leave. Spent six years in the private sector, six months, and then I joined the World Bank as country, sorry, as country director, first for the Cote d'Ivoire group of countries, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo. And then after four years, I moved to Ghana, two and a half years ago. Responsible for Ghana, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. So, the list goes on. I mentioned earlier that rock climbing and uh, some serious effort and dedication. These accomplished leaders are certainly those that put serious effort and dedication to their jobs. And I hope, I'm sure, we will see people from this classroom one day climbing similar paths. Let me talk a little bit about uh, governance and institutions. We cannot talk about institutions if we don't talk about governance. So I will share a little bit about the World Bank's experiences with governance and institutions. Many of you will go on to take leadership roles in various institutions, both in the public and the private sector. Regardless of what type of institution you lead, it is imperative that they are open, effective, and accountable. What makes the World Bank uh, successful in the context of governance is that despite being a very large institution, we face all kinds of challenges from governance challenges. Eh? We, we face issues with staff, we face issues with the clients, we face issues in our projects where sometimes there are attempts to misuse funds. And internally, you know, we are not, we humans, some staff will sometimes behave a little bit more cheeky than others, but we have institutions we have systems of governance inside the bank 
that deal with all kinds of problems. Uh, integrity problems, we have uh, issues with uh, social problems, we have all kinds of internal mechanisms. If somebody is not happy with me, he can go and say, Pierre mistreated me, it's been a year now I've been working with this guy, he read emails, he sends me. I will be called, I will be asked you know, to come and explain. So I'm accountable for my actions also. So that's why it's very important, like I say, wherever you go, it is imperative that institutions are open, effective and accountable, and everyone in the institution should be accountable. We work with ministries, agencies, and departments on managing public institutions and finances. And what we do, we build systems that make assistance more effective by strengthening institutions and improving governance. Because our experience and empirical evidence support effective and accountable institutions for inclusive development. Our work involves a focus on strengthening core government functions in developing countries and developing a public sector grounded in transparency, which combines fiscal transparency, technological innovation, social accountability, anti-corruption efforts, and citizen participation to strengthen the social contract between governments and citizens. On this note, let me thank you, and uh, I look forward to the Q&A sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you. Please feel free to ask me any question. Don't be scared, there's nothing controversial. Anything that you want to know. So just raise your hand if you have a question and we'll bring the mic to you. If you don't mind, just for me to have a feel, can you just tell me which country you're from, at least? So my name is Akwiti Anto, and I'm from Ghana. Yeah, so my question is that, on what basis does the World Bank give grants? Because, for example, let's take Afghanistan. So, recently, they were taken over by the Taliban. And although from the UN, they knew that um, the people in Afghanistan needed grants because they're suffering from poverty, like um, their bank was crashing. But the World Bank decided to halt any you know, grants to them. So like, my question is, on what basis do you give grants? Do you also take in the political aspects of it? OK, earlier, thank you for the question. We give grants and we give loans, like I said, depending on the you know, development status of countries. Earlier, I spoke about uh, the country partnership framework. So for each country, the World Bank has a, a strategy, a framework, and we do that every five to six years, we renew it. And this framework determines what, what you were just asking me. So what we do, we first do a diagnostic of the country constraints, because we, go, we work backward to say, okay, our ultimate objective is to reduce extreme poverty and improve shared prosperity in the world. And now when we do this diagnostic, it's the first step. We go in the country, our teams go and meet governments, we meet uh, the population in the villages, we meet private sector stakeholders, we meet development partners, sometimes academia. And we ask the question, what is it in your view? What are the constraints that are stopping, for instance, Ghana from achieving a better poverty reduction rate, a better development. So diff different people will tell us different things. Some will say corruption, others will say infrastructure, some will say lack of access to finance, some will say lack of inclusiveness, women not participating in development. So what we do, first we look at all these constraints, we analyze them, we rank them. Once we have these, we write the diagnostic, and we, from there, we say, okay, if these are the constraints, these are the pathways for us to deal with these constraints. The next step, we come back, we now say, okay, based on these constraints, these are the areas where we will intervene. So we have a strategy, which again, we do the same. Our teams internally, the technicians, in this case, under my leadership in Ghana, we will come up with a strategy that has focus areas, which I mentioned earlier, 
which are focus areas, which, which aims to point us which areas where we're going to intervene. So for instance, in Ghana, based on the diagnostic, based on the concentrations that we've done, we've, we've seen that we, we, we've, we've taken three focus areas. Like I said, the one is uh, private sector-led development. Why? Because Ghana is a country where private sector is much more dynamic than others. In some countries, especially the fragile countries, the conflict countries, it's difficult for private sector to go there. So you rely more on government. But in countries like Ghana, we believe that private sector can do so much more, even more than they do today. So this is one of our pillars. Secondly, we talked about uh, improved service delivery for human development. Why? Because we believe firmly that a country cannot develop without a, a sound human capital base, a sound uh, a, a sound uh, group of educated people through education, a sound population that are healthy through adequate health services, and having protection, uh, social protection systems to build resilience and help those who cannot access or cannot afford, you know, or don't have a job or cannot afford uh, to live properly. And then the third one uh, is uh, basically resilience, building resilience. We can talk about climate resilience, countries being affected by climate change, so build systems, better drainage, better systems to deal with climate change, but also, also social and economic resilience. Help the people to, to be better prepared to deal with economic shocks if they lose their jobs, if, they, uh, if there are economic shocks, international shocks, oil price shocks affects Ghana because it's a petrol exporting country, exchange shocks because Ghana has high debt level, you know. So we look at all these from our angle. But then what we do, we discuss with government. We know for Ghana, we have an envelope on the IDA. Every three years, we have 1.5 billion. Let's say on average, $500 million every year. So we sit down with the Minister of Finance and the rest of government. We say, okay, we have $1.5 billion for the next three years based on the framework that we have, we believe these are the areas where we want to focus. And we agree, what projects would you like to see in those areas that we can finance? So we arrive at finally determining, say, 10, 12 projects over the next three years on that basis. So it's really a consultative process. We don't just come from Washington and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. It's not like that. Thanks. Um, my name is Abeiku Sombai Akulati. I'm Ghanaian. Now, my first question is, what um, career prospects are there for people who are not financially inclined in the World Bank? And then secondly, I would like to ask, has it always been your vision or your long-term goal to be at the place you find yourself now? And what challenges did you face whilst rising up to that level? Okay, very, very good questions. The first one, the answer is, no, you don't need to be a financial person. Because actually, the, the beauty and what makes me enjoy that work so much is because the work, the World Bank, intervenes in a whole spectrum of development. We have financial specialists. We have macroeconomists. I'm one. But we also have sector specialists. We have health specialists. We have education specialists. We have social protection specialists. We have water specialists. We have road specialists, we have everything. We have climate specialists, environment. Why? Because we need those people for different kinds of projects. So it doesn't mean if you didn't do finance or economic, you don't have a chance at the World Bank. You have equal chance as anybody else. And then secondly, if I thought I would find myself like this, I honestly, no. Uh, I think it, it may be a lesson in life is really to be ambitious. I remember very well like my story, I'll tell you, when I got my first degree, I went back home, I was promoted to a research officer in the economics department. And I said, wow, good, if one day I become a director, I'll be very happy. That will be for me. And then I was asked to, I was offered another scholarship to do my postgraduate. Then I came back and I was promoted to director general. I said, wow, cool. I'll achieve my aim in life, you know. 
But later I worked, I went to the IMF. In 2000, I never, I always to you, I never even thought I would become governor of the Central Bank because in my mind, I'm going to the IMF, maybe I'll come back, an old man, then maybe I can just have a, be an advisor to the governor then and be happy. Then in 2008, they called me. I was what, 39 years old? They said, you need you, we want you to be governor of the Bank. I never imagined. I took on the challenge. I never saw myself returning to the World Bank because, you know, there are a lot of things happening and you're not even thinking long. And then after I told you, went to finance, and then when I left, the World Bank was there, the IMF was there. I, I gave a shot at, uh, I applied for the job and I got the interview and uh, it, turned out, it turned out very well. People tell me, you will become a VP one day. I tell them I don't want to. For whatever reason, you know, because there's always more responsibility as you go higher, no? But I say that today, maybe tomorrow things will change. But I, I don't expect to be a VP. Don't go and say I want to be a VP. I, it's really not. Uh, I think I've, I've been fortunate enough to, I've had this path in my career, experience, not just the positions, but I tell people, working. Well, that's why I'm happy wherever I am. People ask me, oh, you are in Israel, so poor. How could you be happy? I say, happiness is not just about being in a nice place. Happy is what you do. Why I love this job so much? Because we, we deal with, we work with people. We work with poor people. I go in the village, I visit projects, I, I hold children, I hold old people. Nothing makes me feel so happy because we're changing lives of people. And these things people will never understand or appreciate because they see you maybe out there working in Africa. What do you do there? Okay, I come from a small, beautiful island. But because they don't understand what you do in the World Bank, you change the lives of people. And that's really what is more gratifying about this position, this job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Please, my name is Sigurd Bruce, I'm Ganyan. You mentioned internship opportunities. I'd like to know the limitations of your internship opportunities. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on, on the one hand, there is no limitation as to which country you come from or which background you come from, whether you're a man or a woman, etc. The The limitation would be your capacity, your intellectual capacity. Um, once, you're, once you're applying for a high position, like in my case, you are required to have a PhD or maybe a master's sometimes and experience. But an, inter an internship, you, you do not even require to go all the way to have a master's necessarily. All you need to do is to have a, a, a good bachelor with a good, good degree. And, uh, you know, then there's an uh, interview. Everybody's interviewed like the same as you get the job. And we have uh, YP's internships from all other places. Very often, internships come from research assistants at universities. They come there for some time. Or you can be seconded by your governments. Or we have different times when we invite students to consider opportunities. And uh, our role is to make sure that this information is passed on to you. But our website also will provide you with all the information that you need. Thanks. My name is Naomi Evora. I'm from Cote d'Ivoire. I would like to know what... Huh? Yeah. Cote d'Ivoire. I'm from Cote d'Ivoire. You're from Cote d'Ivoire? Yes. Bonjour. And I would like to know where is the money coming from, like the money from the... Yeah. Second question is, for example, if a country like cannot pay back the money that, what happened to this country? <laughs> okay, earlier, thank you, good questions. Earlier I explained that there are, you know, I don't know if I, maybe I didn't say that. There are two types of member countries. There are donor countries who contribute to the World Bank, who don't borrow, and these are mostly the advanced economies, the US, the Canada's, the Europe's. 
the Gulf countries, the Saudi Arabia, etc. And then there are borrower countries who don't contribute, but they borrow, like the Ghanaians or most African countries. And then there are in-betweens, some, some interesting cases like China, which lends and borrows also. Sometimes for strategic reasons, they want to have a place at the board and things like that. So, so essentially, we have a combination of uh, the advanced countries putting the money in the pot. So every three years, we, that's why we have you here IDA cycle, IDA 19, IDA 20, IDA 21, IDA International Development Assistance. So every three years, we go to the donors, those donor countries, and we say, please, we want more for the next cycle. They will tell you generally, okay, we will give you more because they all have their own objectives of helping development. And then generally, we get a bit more than we got the cycle before. For instance, in the last cycle from 20, what we are now, 2020, from 2019 to 22, we got $78 billion in, 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 in IDA, okay, funding. Now we're aiming for 100. I think we will get somewhere between 99 to 100 in this current cycle we're asking for. So there's a combination of those advanced countries putting their money on the table as their contribution to development. Then there are two other sources. One is when we lend to countries, we get interest income. Like any bank lends you money with interest, they get back what they lend plus some interest. And thirdly, we also now for the first time in the last cycle, we go to the financial markets. We go to the financial markets, we borrow some money, and then they package it in a way that becomes attractive enough to own land. So these are the sources where we get the money. And with that money, we give loans mostly to poorer countries. Now, what do you do if you don't pay? You have a problem. <laughs> if you don't pay, you go under sanction. There's a system, uh, uh, a way whereby you, 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 you are given time to, to pay, and then eventually if you still cannot pay, World Bank very rarely writes off debt. World Bank IMF, multilateral institutions like AFDB, very rarely, it's happened only once. Back when there was the HIPIC rescheduling, or HIPIC web, web bilaterals, means countries, the UK, France, Germany, etc. They said to countries back then, we will let you keep the money that you owe us, but you will use it to fund social projects, health, school, hospital. This is what the HIPIC did. And then some years later, it was around 2003, 4, for the first time, World Bank, IMF, and FDB also gave countries some debt relief. It was called MBRI, Multilateral Debt restructuring initiative. But it, it probably will not happen again, at least not for a long, long time. So essentially, countries have to pay their debt. If they don't pay, you get under sanction. You cannot borrow anymore until you've paid more debt. My Bye. name is Louisa Yanga, and I'm from Ghana. My question is, are there terms and conditions applied when a country comes to the World Bank to like borrow money or apply for grants or something like that? Are there some things they can use the money for, they can't use the money for? Yeah, good question. The, you see, there are, there are different terms and conditions for different kinds of borrowing. We do, we do broadly two types of lending. One is project lending, which is just, we say we want to build a hospital in Ghana. We will go to the Ministry of Health, we'll agree will be our hospital. This is the design, etc., etc. Then once we are ready, our board approves the, the money, we will create a special unit, project implementation unit, where we will bring a group of staff to manage the project. Project money never goes to the government. Many people ask us, are you sure that government doesn't misuse your money? They cannot generally because project funding goes in an account, we call that a designated account, outside government budget that is controlled by us and by the ministry in question. So generally, for projects, there are not major conditions. We just have to agree on the design of the project, the, 
you have to make sure that uh, safeguards issues. When I call, when I say about safeguards, I generally mean environmental and social issues are addressed. For instance, if we if we're building a hospital on a space where people live, we have to relocate them. We have to make sure the condition is very serious. This, the World Bank takes safeguards very seriously. The people in that zone, they have to be compensated based on laws, standards, and practices. If this is not met, you will not get the project. Likewise, if we're building a, I don't know, a dam, there are, I'll give you a concrete example. There was a dam in Guinea or Sierra Leone a couple of years ago. The world wanted to, the World Bank wanted to put money for the dam. But it meant flooding an area to build a dam where there are some special types of chimpanzees or something like that. It becomes an environmental issue. Finally, the World Bank decided, as much as the project is important, we will not kill these chimpanzees. So we step back. These are the kind of conditions for projects. Now, there's another very important kind of lending called development policy lending. I'll tell you why development policy. In general terms, we call it budget support. Well, it's different from the project because this one, we give government, it goes in the consolidated account, the treasury in government's accounts. But, but, it's called development policy lending because unlike building a project which is a physical asset country gets, this one is to help country pursue reforms, policy reforms. For instance, if in, uh, I don't know, we know about energy sector in Ghana, there are lots of problems today. We tell you, you can give you 300, 200 million dollar in policy support in cash, but on the condition that you take actions, policy actions, measures that will address the problems that exist in the sector. So what we do, we agree with government, if it's a three year, generally it's a two to three year trances project, which is support operation. What we say the first year, you call that prior actions. You have 10 things you need to do policy-wise. It can be in any sector. It can be in health. It can be putting in place your social protection system. It could be anything. So the first year, you say, okay, this is evidence. All the policy reforms I agreed to do with you, I've done it. We disperse. And then with that, there are triggers. We call that triggers because it's the next set of reforms. It goes on like that. So bottom line is conditions depend on the kind of lending we're doing. My name is Yolina Krofi, and I'd like to ask what kind of contributions you guys have done, the World Bank has done pre-pandemic um, and post-pandemic in terms of cash and in terms of employment opportunities. Could you please tell us? Okay. Like I said, like I said before, thank you for the question. Like I said before, since uh, 1957, we've been giving uh, uh, support to, to Ghana. There are many things we've done. We've built many roads, we've built hospitals, we've built many schools, we've done agriculture projects, we've supported farmers, we've done many water projects. I've visited quite a few in the last year or so. So we've basically given money in many sectors but we've also given i would say soft like we have a social protection project we just approved this year 100 million dollars last march because we had a project we target really the really poorest and we go and give them a little bit of cash cash transfer we call that and there are criteria that is that i established we just don't go and say we give you 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 there are criteria it's agreed with the local community local authorities so before pandemic, we've been doing this for years, all along. Every year, like I say, we give the latest one was about half a billion dollars every year to Ghana. Now, when pandemic came, we've given Ghana $435 million in just under two years for COVID pandemic. We first gave 105 million, then that was in around June, July last year. Then we approved another 100 million 
earlier this year. I think it was January, February. And then another 130 million. But, but basically, we've helped in COVID in different, at, at different levels. The first $100 million was really to fight the immediate impact of the pandemic, huh? to, to get PPE, PPEs, right? PPEs, to get uh, communication campaigns out, to get ventilators. That was the dealing with the emergency. We did, the second money was to complement that it because you know, the pandemic was more prolonged than we thought. But now finally, the 130 million, actually we give 200 million, sorry, of which 140 has gone to buy vaccines. So we've bought vaccines for 16 million, well, we bought 16 million doses of vaccines for Ghana. So we've helped about eight to nine million Ghanaians directly by giving vaccines. And we continue to give support in the rollout right? because it's fine thing to give you vaccine, put in your arm, but the infrastructure, the cold chains, you know, the sensitization, we all know vaccine hesitancy, all of these things are, uh, uh, uh. but that's why, that's why in the, in the three year, I call that cycle for financing, the World Bank decided to do it only two cycles because most countries, they used up at least one third of their resources that were planned for development to help COVID. So they decided to speed up the next round, which starts in July next year. So we've done, we've done a lot. So my question is that, yeah, my question is that the countries, the constraints he said earlier on, do they apply to the countries with veto powers? A veto powers? Yes. And the second is that with the COVID-19 pandemic that happened last year, um, there was an economic, a worldwide economic downfall. So what did the World Bank do to ensure that these economic downfalls didn't really affect the world that much? And what are your steps or your plans to counter these situations, situations similar to this in the future? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, veto power. Actually, only one, only one country in the, in the institution like the IMF has veto power, that's the US. Because of the amount of money historically when the thing was created, the US can veto anything. They very rarely use it, but they've used it before. Um, and you know, veto is veto. Once it's vetoed, you cannot do anything. In terms of the, the, the adverse developments of the pandemic, you know, because these were mostly ex exogenous. Now we have endogenous shocks, exogenous shocks. Which mean endogenous is when it comes internally, exogenous when it comes outside. Look, some, most of it, it's been very difficult to do anything about it. Uh, some countries who, who, who could afford it have given uh, uh, fiscal packages, pump money in the economy to help, like in the US, pay the companies, etc. In Ghana, to be fair, um, on, the, on what we've done, we have several projects that were there, you know, being implemented. We've tried to accelerate these projects to make resources available from different dimensions. We had, like I said, we help on the health, health front with money for COVID, but we also accelerated, for instance, our social protection project. And that's why the 100 million we gave last March was supposed to be given one or two years down the line. But because we accelerated implementation to help people in that time, we were required to replenish and approve a new project. We've also done the same with some of our SME projects. We've made money available for government to help certain SMEs in that time to deal with the recovery. And as you know, government of Ghana itself has put money to help the country. As you know, Ghana's debt was in the, I would say, mid-60s mid before COVID pandemic. I mean, 60% of GDP, I say. Now it's close to 80 because government injected money into the economy at the time when revenues were not coming. Because as you know, when COVID happened, businesses stopped. Government could not collect any tax revenues. Likewise, the oil shock meant it affected the price of oil in Ghana, an exporting country, oil exporting country was also affected. So there's been a combination of, uh, 
of measures through government budget itself, but also through development partners like ours. And IMF has given initially $1 billion to Ghana to help in, that, uh, in, in the pandemic. And recently there was uh, an initiative whereby, it's a bit complex, but whereby the, those countries who are members of the IMF, each of us put a contribution. It's called your SDR allocation. SDR is the currency that IMF and World Bank sort of use operationally. So countries agreed to use these contributions on the balance sheet to convert it into cash and help countries. And Ghana benefited as part of this. So this was also a way to help the country deal with the shocks. Um, good afternoon. My name is, my name is Pete and I'm from Nigeria. My question is, when lending money to countries, is there a must for you to know what they, what they will use the money for? And if it's that case, what happens when you don't use the money for the intended purpose? So, um, he says he's from Nigeria. And that when you lend money to countries, is it a must for you to use the money for a specific purpose? And what if you don't use the money for that? Okay, so when you give money out to countries in terms of loans, is it a must for you to know what the country wants to use the money for? Must you know? Yeah, yeah, because we agree with countries. We, we, don't, we don't decide unilaterally Oh, Pierre, I like uh, this minister, or I'm an economist, I'm going to do budget support because I like it. No, like I said before, the framework that exists determines the areas where we will intervene, and we agree jointly with the government, with the country. And then within that space, Minister of Health can tell me, I want this kind of health project. Minister of Education can tell me, either I want a school or I want support to train my teachers. But, but when we give the money, it has to go for that. That's why we have fiduciary teams that follow every six months. We do an audit on the project. We say, okay, you were supposed to spend, because we have what we call a procurement plan. When the project is approved, the whole amount of money is allocated to this. If you're gonna buy six vehicles, you're gonna build uh, 16 canteens, you're gonna build 20 boreholes. All of these things are comfortable. You cannot now go and do 40 balls when you agree to do six. So our teams will pick this up and either we will have to sometimes reorganize, we call that restructure, or there are times also, and I'm being very honest, it happens in all countries, not just in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, Liberia, everywhere. You find that for whatever reason, either some minister or some coordinator of the project decides to spend the money on other things. <clears throat> and now what we do, we ask government to, re to return the money. Okay, we've had it here, we've had it everywhere. So if you use the money which was supposed to go to do a bridge, you've used it to buy cars, it's called an ineligible expense. It was not eligible, so we tell Minister of Finance, your minister X, Y, Z has spent $200,000, which we consider as ineligible, please refund, otherwise, your project will not move. We will not disperse the actual money that is there. Yeah. You don't need a mic. That's good. I'm not the hero. Yes, doctor. No, it's a, it's a good question. It's a, it's a fair question because we hear it all the time. I, I tell you personally, uh, when I was working with the IMF in the early 2000s, I actually felt, I felt the evolution in the 
in the country in that the days when IMF would just come and say you have to do A, B, C, D, otherwise we're going out of here. But this has changed. This has changed. It's changed over the years. Uh, it, it's changed in the past, you know, Seychelles does that, Mauritius, you have to do that because it's an island like you. This has changed. Today, really, in my view, the World Bank likewise, like me, I, I tell my people, we don't, we don't dictate anything to the country. But I can tell a minister, minister, why are you asking me to go to put the money? I'm sorry, I will not put the money because it's not in line with your priorities, with the strategy that we agreed. It's not addressing the constraint, which is more priority. But everything is done in consultation now. Even, look, you know, it's, especially for the IMF, I think it's more difficult because IMF deals more with the difficult policy reforms. For instance, look at Ghana today. You know, a country to, to develop, to do your social program, your, to build schools, roads, etc. You need money. Where's the money? You collect taxes, right? Or you get grants. Grants are never enough. And taxes are, taxes are something that existed even, you go back in the Bible, pre-Christ, tax was something of a principle, a community principle. But tax should not be penalizing, should not be in excess. So generally you will find IMF and even us, when we do a budget support, we say always, the macro framework has to be sustainable, has to be adequate, which means your budget cannot be too much out of line, your deficit cannot be huge because it will add to your debt burden and later you may not be able to pay us back. So by having a, you know, a sustainable and adequate macroeconomic framework, it, it, it's like an insurance policy for us and for your country to manage itself. But generally what happens is this comes with hard policies. In Ghana, for instance, today, the ratio of revenue tax and indirect taxes to GDP is about 12%. We say all the time, it's not acceptable. Because if you don't collect enough domestic revenues, you'll have to borrow or you don't do the project. People don't develop. The countries don't develop. So you have to have a right balance. And what, not me, the ECOWAS, the YMU, have set themselves a norm of 20% debt revenue GDP ratio. Why? Because it's considered this is the level of tax revenue collection that is not overly penalizing the population, but that in line with experience, empirical evidence, is sort of the ballpark average where you need to be able to support your own development to complement what others give you. So Ghana has to up the game. And we, when Ghana comes to us to say we need $300 million budget support, we say no problem, we'll help you because we see the need. But you also need to do something about it. You need to take some measures that will raise that revenue, not because I want to raise it, because you know yourself is not there, but polit political is difficult. So, yeah. Yeah, you need, to, you need the measures to, to make your economy sustainable. But the problem with that is over the past, I think because the approach, the way the IMF and the World Bank carried business. In the past, World Bank was a big uh, promoter of privatization. Yeah, I, I also believe, if, you, if allow me, let me just finish, please. I also believe that uh, government should not be doing business, but, but, I want also who believes there is a role for government in certain areas where the market feels government should be allowed to continue to do business in certain priority areas where maybe the private will not go. At the same time, we cannot privatize, we call that a public monopoly, and make it a private monopoly because you will not affect. So, we are conscious of these things. And if you ask me, I try to answer your question. I think both IMF and World Bank has evolved over the years. Maybe there's more to do. For instance, today, another example. In every World Bank project, we are, we are required to engage citizens. In the past, if I did a project in Tamale, my teams go, they look at this, they look at that, they come back, we're gonna do it. 
doesn't work like that anymore. No, it's not. Believe me, it's not. Because I'll tell you why it's not. Today, if we go to Tamale to do a road, we will have to go and meet the mayor or the, okay? Do you agree that we do that road? If it doesn't happen, we will not do it. And we set up, we work with NGOs, with CSOs, we engage them to monitor our projects. And they come and give us reports. In that project there, there's something happening. Okay, either government is not doing its bit, or your people, the World Bank team is not. Believe me, and as country director, every time we approve projects, there's a stage before regional VP approval comes to me, we call that decision stage. I always have my list of questions there. I read the, the agenda, citizen engagement. Some people will say, peer reviewers, we lack, you know, it covers very well, gender aspects are covered very well. If not, I will tell them, colleagues, I see here that citizen engagement, gender, are not adequately addressed. Please go back and fix it before I clear your project. Believe me, it's not cosmetic. We are required by the corporate, uh, the bosses in DC to do it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, so much. We are grateful, Pierre, for the time spent with us. So Pierre just didn't come alone. He came along with some books uh, to help our library for your reading um, and knowledge as well. So, So, let me call on Dr. Aaron to receive the books on behalf of the school. Yes. Yes. It's not only finance, economics, it's about development, it's about uh, different things, uh, different aspects of development. So, it's my pleasure to... Thank you so much. Um, so just as I, we also do it every week. We don't also let our guests go empty-handed. Uh, we also have a little gift for our guest speaker this afternoon. And, and uh, let me call Grace to do the presentation on our behalf. So Grace is from Cote d'Ivoire, and Pierre um, is coming to Ghana from Cote d'Ivoire. He was a country manager for Cote d'Ivoire before he came here. So. Grace, do that for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of um, ACT students, um, I extend my hearty votes of thanks to Mr. Pera Laporte. So thank you for like taking your time to come guide and educate us on things we don't know about. So we give a very big thanks.